Welcome to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, where your co-hosts, Dale Yuzuki, Cindy Lawley, and Sarantis Klamidis from Olink Proteomics, talk about the intersection of proteomics with genomics for drug target discovery, the application of proteomics to reveal disease biomarkers, and current trends in using proteomics to unlock biological mechanisms. Here we have your hosts, Dale, Cindy, and Sarantis. Thank you for joining us on the Proteomics and Proximity podcast. I'm your host, Dale Yuzuki, with my co-host, Cindy Lawley, and my other co-host, Sarantis Klamidis. Great. This morning, we are talking about Empower Genomics with Proteomics. And Cindy, I'd like to ask you the question, if I'm involved in genomics, why should I add proteomics? Well, I'm so happy that you asked me that, Dale. So, uh, as you know, I tell this story quite a bit, and so I'm delighted to, to do it in the context with both of you, because you will add so much to this. But, you know, we've got a big project going with the UK Biobank. Uh, it, the UK Biobank, uh, of course, being one of the largest um, nationally associated population biobanks in the world with clinical, genetic, and now on a subset of, of over 54,000 samples uh, of proteomic data, uh, it, it's an exciting time, I think, to demonstrate in large populations the value of layering proteomics Onto genomics, and of course, we've we've across many cohorts invested a lot in genomics as the costs have have gone down. Now, to back up a little bit, the UK Biobank. Tell me a little bit about it. Sure. So, general. so yeah, it's as it as the name implies. It's the um, based in the UK. It's affiliated with you know the, the UK has, you know, one of the largest single payer healthcare systems in the world and having a population based biobank primarily of northern european descent or ancestry but certainly representing asian as well as as african uh and african diaspora descent as well pakistani descent there's quite a a nice subset of diversity in the biobank but primarily it's it's northern european you know it was it was started what i think 20 years ago i actually should know that off the top of my head but it was it was started with the promise of being able to characterize the value of longitudinal information to healthcare. And uh, I think um, Eric Topol says that it takes about 20 years on average to move something from discovery to the clinic. He uses the example of um, the stethoscope. And moving the stethoscope into the clinic took 17 years. That seems like a pretty simple mechanism, right? <laughs> Listening to your heart. <laughs> But yet it took a long time for it to be demonstrated and, and approved and to get into the clinic in routine use. So and by longitudinal, then you mean, I, I think they recruit, what, half a million individuals? And longitudinal means what, they follow them over time? It means that they're able to call them back. So they're able, they have medical access to their, you know, clinical data over time. They understand over time what is, um, you know, what is outcomes within this population. And I think that's incredibly valuable. That consenting has changed over time. So the ability to actually uh, call back wasn't initially in many of these biobanks, right? And so I, I I think of FinGen as one of those, another biobank that's based in Finland, a population uh, health biobank as well. They really did sort of lead the way with some of the ability to share data and protect it at the same time, you know, primarily focused on genetics. And, uh, and I would say UK Biobank as well has led the way in these abilities to work with both prov private and public partnerships. So being able to work with um, pharma, and in this case with the proteomic data, this initial set of proteomic data that was initially started with 10 pharma partners, the... Um, the model was interestingly based upon the exome sequencing consortium. So a group of pharma partners came together in order to get some ex to get the the participants within the UK Biobank uh, exome sequenced. There's of course also I think it's 150,000 
uh, individuals in the UK Biobank that are also whole genome sequenced, which is pretty phenomenal, right? <laughs> That's a huge number. <laughs> so imagine the, the investment yeah, of all of those dollars and time and and the potential for building analysis tools with such large data sets, right? That's that's you know goes without saying. I remember, I think it was 2018. I was at ASHG, which is the American Society for Human Genetics, and I was blown away by all of the talks that were referencing the UK Biobank data, building tools, having discoveries. Right? I, I'm excited to see that same evolution in um, in the discussion with crowdsourcing these data with proteomics. So to get that, back to your original question, Dale, mm-hmm. <laughs> what's the value? I think Karsten Suri would say that um, when you have genetic data and you have disease, that there's a certain power you have to detect the relationship between the two. And in some cases, we have smoking guns like BRCA, right? So we're able to, to see that there's a lot of penetrance for a variant that, that shows up and has a lot of influence on, on predisposition to disease. But for most diseases, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? Small uh, amounts of um, influence. Cindy, this UK Biobank sounds so interesting. What can you tell me more about it? Yeah, so so the UK Biobank itself is a longitudinal collection of data. I think it it started um, in the mid-2000s, so around 2006. They targeted uh, an an age group, sort of middle age group, and they followed them over time. And so it's over half a million individuals within the UK. Yeah, quite quite an undertaking to enroll all those participants. And, And what I will never forget is when I attended um, ASHG, so American Society of Human Genetics, in in 2018, the number of talks, I remember searching on UKBB as just an, a short an acronym, and the number of talks talking about using the UKB data, particularly genetic data, uh, for validating clinical findings um, was... There were a lot of talks. So it's um, always been high on Illumina's radar, and it's very high on all of those sequencing technology innovator radar, uh, innovators' radars, um, like Thermo Fisher, of course, and all of those library prep companies that support so they, different methods of library prep. Have they already sequenced everybody? So they've got um, whole genome sequence on, I think it's about 150,000 individuals. That was primarily led by um, by Decode Genetics, as I understand it. Uh, the publication is pretty recent, actually. So it's a, um, there's a lot to dig into. It's a pretty phenomenal data set. The, um, the bulk of the sequencing for most samples, I believe, is exome sequencing. That's my understanding. So I think it's, it's over 450,000 individuals. So I think for some, they've got both. Um, and since it's a single payer system with the electronic records of NHS, that yeah. means they can drill down into exactly right their whole hexome sequence and whatever condition that they may have. And this is an That's ongoing right. thing. Is that right? Cancer, right. diabetes. That's right. And the ability to actually return results to those patients, I think, has evolved over time, right? Because that costs money to set expectations, make sure that we're we're communicating uh, in a in a way that's best practices. So I think that the UK Biobank has spearheaded a lot of um, our understanding about best practices there as well. And so, as far so, as go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say. So back to your original question about what's the value of layering proteomics onto genomics. This is a great example where an enormous amount of investment has gone into collecting genetic information for this very valuable population with advances in, you know, diagnostics, in guiding cancer treatments, right? A lot of these advances have made it to the clinic already, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, and that's been driven, you know, globally. It's it's exciting. Where proteomics fits in, or the way that I think of it, I was... Um, I had a conversation with Karsten Suri, who's at Wheel Cornell in, in Qatar and, and in New York. And he, he really, I had an aha moment with him. He, he essentially would say that 
an intermediate phenotype like proteomics acts to magnify the effect between genetics and disease. So, of course, we've been looking for these associations between genetics and disease uh, since we've been collecting genetic information. And some of those links are hard to see because we need so many samples to be able to see them. And so as we've increased the numbers of samples, like in the UK Biobank, we're able to make these associations uh, more clearly. And, And I'll say, you know, we wished early on, we hoped for smoking guns for a lot of diseases. And we we did see a few of them, right? So there's certainly PCSK9 for uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. These are some, some standard ones, BRCA for breast cancer. Uh, there's, there's some examples where we have a lot of penetrance or a lot of, um, you know, a lot of effect on someone's uh, likelihood of getting a disease uh, from single variants or single loci or single genes. Um, But for most diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, this is a death by a thousand cuts, meaning lots of variants give a little tiny effect in changing our risk. And so that's where, that's where having, having the ability to amplify or to put a magnifying glass on those, those relationships between genetics and disease is incredibly useful. So I think, you know, a ton of, of work has been done in proteomics and cardiovascular disease. And I think many advances uh, have happened there. Now, getting back to the UK Biobank, you mentioned before that uh, recently they're working with Olink then to look at the proteomes of tens of thousands of individuals. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's not just the UK Biobank, but, but 13 pharma partners, right? So, so it certainly required, um, consent and, and partnership with the UK Biobank. Just like the exome sequencing consortium was was done in collaboration with the UK Biobank, but the access to the technology, just like with the exome sequencing consortium, access to the technology was spearheaded by pharma partners that were very keen to build a structure for a more, I like to say, a systematic approach to therapeutic target discovery. Not only biomarker discovery, which is sort of traditional proteomics, but to, to therapeutic target discovery, which I think is enabled by genetics, uh, proteomics, as well as clinical data. So we're getting back to this idea of empowering genomics with proteomics, right? Exactly. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so I think there's this, you know, I, I immediately think of that Karsten Surrey magnifying glass, right? But uh, the the UK Biobank's initial findings, which are in a preprint that came out in June, middle of June, uh, that's on BioArchive, their initial paper really just was scratching the surface of what's possible with this um, enormous data set. So their first paper was about 1,500 proteins. So our first our first product, that the Olink first product on the Explore platform that has the NGS readout so they used that first tranche of, of proteins across 54,000 samples. And the first, really the, the bulk of those data are to look at correlations between gene regions, you know, and, and the genotypes in those gene regions, and protein levels. So really just looking, what are the correlations? What's the list of all the possible relationships between genetic regions and protein levels that might be elucidated and examined further in this beautiful data set. What I would, you know, and I'll speculate on what I think they're going to be doing next and what my guess is that they're very um, deep into doing this within these companies is to then do Mendelian randomization, which is a statistical approach to kind of determine which of these relationships, which of these correlations between gene regions and, and protein levels, you know, when you put it, when you bring in the clinical data on disease, which of these hold up as being unlikely to be happening by chance alone? So now you sort of have the um, the ones that are likely just you know co- coincidence. I mean, they might still be important, but but let's just I think pharma would like to have ten great targets uh, over four hundred unsure targets because that that's a lot of rabbit holes to go down. So if they can narrow it down, then uh, then I think there's a lot of um, excitement around being able to have some quick wins with proteomics, genomics, and clinical data. Well, to back up just a little bit, you're talking about Mendelian randomization 
you're talking about genomic data in terms of a whole exome of 10,000 people or 50,000 people. And now you're talking about 1,500 proteins. Can Mm -hmm. you walk me through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So so when you're looking at the genetic data, and here we've got... um, you know, some whole genome sequencing data as well as exome sequencing data. So you can imagine you have a list of ways or places in the genome, almost like um, like geographic locations, uh, almost GPS coordinates in the on the chromosomes, where we know they vary across the mm-hmm. samples. So those variable regions, we'll call them SNPs. You know, they're, that that's the term that that we use for the simplest kind of variation, just single base pair variation, but we'll just call them SNPs because there can be other kinds of variation that are captured there too. But if you look at the variants, just a single variant within the genome, you can look at the um, the representation of what people's genotype is at that location, and you can look at every single protein in that 1,500 protein list and see, do we have a significant correlation between the genotype and the protein level. So that's sort of the first step. That's a lot of tests, right? But a lot of comparisons. Ahead, See, as far as I understand, these SNPs could be also outside of the gene, right? Could be also Absolutely. regulatory research, right? Yep, it's not like yep. necessarily falling into the gene. Is any threshold to what, to what they are checking? Which research do they check in the gene? Yeah, so there's both a, a, a statistical threshold that they accept as a as a standard, but also when you're doing so many tests, you have to correct for multiple tests, right? Because the more tests you do, the, you're increasing your chances of seeing a false positive. So adjusting for that um, is something that, you know, we go through peer review to make sure we have uh, best practices and agreement on. I mean, these statistical associations are are massive. I mean, in a yeah. given single individual's whole genome, you're looking at maybe 4 million SNPs, yeah. right? So you have 4 million SNPs, and then you've got, 1500 proteins you're associating those with if i understand you correctly yeah and then you yep. multiply this times what they did 54,000 individuals they did 54,000 <laughs> individuals so i mean and they discovered so you know about 10,000 i think it was around 10,200 relationships between gene regions and protein levels right that's a massive number so that's those those could many of those could just be coincidence, right? Just correlations, not causation, right? We we're all familiar with that that um, phrase. So so eighty five percent of those relationships were novel. Now the and relationships could be, see, could be I'm sorry could be okay. cis and trans both of them correlation or what's that Sarantas cis cis and trans could be like these correlations could be yeah, that this so. Yeah, so these correlations can be in what we call cis or they can be in trans. So cis just is get, getting back to Dale's question about whether, or actually it was your question, Sarantis, about whether these variants, these SNPs, are inside genes or or are they outside I genes? And if they're in genes or, or in close proximity to the genes that code for the protein itself, mm-hmm. right? So you've got a variant that's in a gene coding for a protein, if you see a correlation that's significant between those two, we call that a cis PQTL. And that's a feel-good measure that says, oh, we must be measuring the right protein if this is real. Then, And, and there's ways to, to press on it, to check it, and validate it, of course, with orthogonal data. But that's a... That, so people often talk about... Cis PQTL discoveries being verification of of having measured the right protein, because of course our assay is not is not a mass spec method. We're using uh, antibodies as hooks. We're using two antibodies as a hook to hook a protein out of uh, out of solution, and we have uh, little single stranded oligos attached to them. So those oligos can then hybridize. We can extend and amplify that up just like any old library prep for for sequencing. And then we count those oligos as a proxy for the original level of the proteins in the sample. And so when you're doing an affinity method, right, a hooking method to pull it out, not only is it great for low abundant proteins, that's one of the things we add value to with with mass spec folks. They they like us because they can look at areas of the proteome they, they couldn't see easily with mass spec without tons of sample and a lot of a lot of control of variability. 
So it's 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 a nice method uh, from that perspective, but it's um it's a little bit indirect because we're we're pulling out the protein and converting it to a DNA signal. So making sure we have a way to normalize those data. And, um, and, you know, just like with mass spec and any proteomics experiment, to manage variability from batch to batch, you know, uh, these are important aspects that, that proteomics scientists are much better prepared to describe or explain than I am. But now, I have come to appreciate it. <laughs> now, now, Cindy, something that you touched upon, right, was the sort of drug discovery dimension of this. But even before we go in that direction, you also mentioned something in terms of SNPs and genes. Hmm. The majority of GWAS, thousands, right? 3,500 GWAS studies or right, yeah. many, many, many. Uh, oftentimes, these SNPs that are associated with risk often are gene deserts or they're in, right? There's no function. That's right. That's right. What can you comment on that, right? So these PQTLs, right, are SNPs, but aren't they just random, so to speak, random places in the genome? Yeah, so good question. So I'm going to reference a a paper by um, Lassie Fulkerson and Anders Mallerstig. Now, the two of them, along with collaborators, there's a a, a long list of authors that I won't won't list, brilliant, um, obviously, across multiple cohorts. They've uh, their milestone paper within a, a study called the Scallop Study, which is really a, a cohort of cohorts. Um, they were doing what the UK Biobank wants to do. Uh, this is me putting words in the UK Biobank's mouth, but but I think that the Folker Senadal milestone publication is a powerful precursor to what the UK Biobank um, is is has the possibility to do. In Folker Senadal, they looked at just 90 proteins. I say just, although at the mm. time in 2020, that was, that was a lot of multiplex proteins, of course. They looked at cardio, primarily cardiovascular, what we, what we broadly categorize as cardiovascular proteins, and they did the same kind of, of, of study. So on 30,000 samples, they looked at 90 proteins with genetic, clinical, and proteomic data. They did the correlations, just like the UK Biobank has done in their preprint. The 90 proteins resulted in 450, you know, a little over 450 PQTLs. Some of those are cis PQTLs, as Sarantis hints on, right? So 88% of the proteins had cis PQTLs identified there. That's, like I said, a feel-good method uh, method to, or something we can kind of point to to say this, this, this looks like it's you know, increasing our confidence that we're measuring the right protein, although there are good biological reasons why you might not see a cis-PQTL. Uh, but the, the, the remaining um, trans-PQTLs were uh, essentially discovery of trans-PQTLs is incredibly important to understand protein-protein interactions. So I may have taken a bit of a meandering way to get back to your question, Dale, about mm-hmm about these relationships, but trans-PQTLs um, and figuring out where those are coding, you know, what proteins are they coding for? What gene regions are they associated with? Is It's not a trivial matter. And so I've had discussions with Lassie as well as Anderson, or sorry, as well as Anders around this um this challenge. And so just to define trans PQTL, so as a reminder, cis PQTLs are where you have the, the gene variant is either in or near the gene that codes for the protein that you're measuring. So the relationship between them, the uh, correlation is between the gene region and the protein itself. That's a cis PQTL. So a you trans- say you have, say you have a particular protein you're measuring, we'll say, uh, TNF alpha or alpha yep. TNF, and, and the SNP then that codes for alpha TNF is in the same chromosome within I don't know a couple a million hundred, base pairs a million the base pairs okay yeah. so megabase. you're in the general yeah. in the general region that's and right and so there could be those million base pairs a lot of other genes but nonetheless True. right True. you're saying that that particular SNP was controlling alpha TNF. It suggests that. Okay. I think they right. might not, yeah, they may not say it quite so 
strongly simply because there's, you know, it's association. Always, it's yeah, a, exactly. It's exactly. a statistical calculation. Got it. And so with a trans PQTL, what that is, is you've got a variant, you know, you might have a gene coding for a protein uh, and that gene might be on chromosome nine, but you might have the PQTL on chromosome 19. You know, you might have it on a completely different pr- chromosome, a correlation with that same protein. So the, the, sort of Occam's razor, you know, the easiest, the most straightforward possibility is that that there's a relationship between those two proteins, right? That there's protein-protein interactions going on there. And, and in uh. fact, the string database is a publicly available database that records and, and collects and is curated around protein-protein interactions. And so what the team would do, you know, in asking them how they, how do they dig into each of these relationships? And what they would do is look, they report the closest gene to the location that's in trans with this protein. They, they report the closest gene geographically. And then they also report, because they do kind of a deep dive into surrounding genes, as you say, Dale, there could be, mm. you know, surrounding genes that, that might be implicated. They look at those other surrounding genes and they say, you know, what's the shortest pathway back to that protein? And that is a fascinating conversation because once you, mm. once you put together a pathway analysis like that, and, and we talk about different diseases, now you've got some pathways in, say, Alzheimer's disease, and you've got some pathways in, say, schizophrenia. I'm just picking two neurological diseases. And now if you can imagine a Venn diagram of the pathways those two have in common, that is an opportunity for us to understand the mechanistic biology that's in common between those two neurological diseases. If if any, you know, I'm just picking those out of, out of, out of the air. If you can return back to that Fulkerson landmark paper. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, there were 90 proteins, how many tens of thousands of samples? 30,000 samples, just okay. over. So we had yeah. 30,000 samples times 90 proteins, and they also had like whole genome data on those 30,000 individuals, is that right? They had genetic data that you could, so I don't know that, remember this is a cohort of cohorts, mm. so I think they had GWAS data or genotyping data, you know, array data on some of those, and sequencing data on others. I, I wouldn't want to represent that, but I, my guess is that they... They had use variation. the genetic da- data that they yep. had in common, right? Because you can yep. convert a, genet- a whole genome sequencing data set to a list of variants, just Understood. like you can yeah, in a Right, GWAS. so they had yeah. all the genetic data of 30,000 individuals. They looked at these 90 proteins, and then you mentioned that they're able to connect it then to disease? Yeah, so, so you do the same thing, this look at, at relationships between genetic you know, state and protein levels. So you look for all those correlations. In this paper, they found 450 PQTLs that that exceeded their significance threshold. And you could, you know, as you touched on before, there, you know, that's why we have peer review to make sure that we're not, um, that we're, that we're mm. held accountable for the number of tests that we're doing, that we're, you know, we're really trying to be as, as um, transparent as possible in, in publishing these data. And by the way, it was published in Nature Metabolism in, in 2020. So once you, you see all the correlations, you imagine you, you have this list of correlations, you, you can layer those clinical data then in. So now you know, you know the disease information, and you can look at these different sets of data, so genetic proteomics and disease and you can sample from these and determine how often would the relationships between three of these units, how often would that happen by chance alone? If it would happen by chance alone quite often, then we let that fall away. If it seems quite unusual to see these relationships, then those are the ones that we elevate to potential causality. I guess so in this paper, they elevated from the 450 relationships correlations, they elevated 25 that they suggest appear causal. And some of those examples, I think, are, are, are validated, well, I know, are validated uh, clinical targets for existing therapies. Super exciting, because then it's like, oh, looks like we're on the right track, right? And then, of course, some novel findings. So they, they report uh, 14 validated clinical targets, known clinical targets, like CASP8 and breast cancer was one of them that, that um, 
I can think of. So caspate uh, then, is, a, is something known already before to be involved right. in breast cancer? That's but right. But then they caspate rediscovered an, it? Yeah, caspate is a known therapeutic target in, in breast cancer. I see. And then 11 of those were novel. So they were not able to see any evidence of 11 of their findings that elevated again to causality, potential causality. And those are the exciting ones for, for a new programs, potentially. And then, uh, and then 18, they, they reported 18 potential repurposing opportunities. So that's super exciting to me because if you've got a, a existing drug for one indication, say, um, tocilizumab for rheumatoid arthritis, and you have you you have the possibility of then using that in a different indication that that would be a repurposing opportunity. So, for example, in eczema, I guess it doesn't make sense to think about using an anti-rheumatoid arthritis uh, drug, right? That's on market to treat eczema. That just, I mean, why there's one eczema? in clinic. There's one in clinical <laughs> trials. I mean, coming back to the cohorts, uh, Cindy, I think also the fact that these uh, cohorts are from difficult geographical places uh, increase the possibility to eliminate, for example, uh, biases on SNPs, right? Uh, did you have any discussion with, uh, with authors about that? Did, do they ever consider that a bias, geographical bias may influence their data? Can you comment on this? Yeah, it's a great question. So... Uh, they m- primarily represent Northern European populations. Mm-hmm. There were there was some representation of Asian populations in there, uh, but not a not a lot. And I'm trying to remember. I don't think there was any African diaspora in this milestone paper in the subset of samples that they had in this milestone paper. So that's. Um, that's a, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, right? For them, mm-hmm. it eases the analysis, to your point, for uh, the opportunity to make discoveries because of diversity within the ancestry of our genomes. It's a miss, right? And yeah. an enormous potential future opportunity, which I think is very exciting and very important for equity in healthcare. I mean, essential, so we have to start somewhere, though, right? So we start yeah, with the absolutely. populations that we have. Um, I, it's fascinating thinking about the 90 proteins, all the different things it discovered, right? These 25 drug targets for that, that explains why the pharma interest in the UK biobank. By doing the extrapolation, <laughs> have you done the extrapolation? How many uh, drug ah. targets they expect? Yeah, so if this... You know, it's around 5.5% of the PQTLs discovered in, in Fulkerson et al. converted to, you know, potentially causal. Interesting. Uh, so if we applied that same percentage, which is lofty, right? That's, it, may, it has a lot of proteins. And and uh, these mm-hmm. 90 in Fulkerson et al. were pretty well um, studied, you know, considering across 30,000 samples. So, you know, I would, I would ex- expect maybe four... Four and a half percent to maybe five percent converting in um, in this initial set of proteins. I think just to be a little conservative, you know, not not trying to be too bullish. But even with that, we're talking about potentially listing off causal markers to examine to Im- investigate potentially causal markers of you know around five hundred. So um, five hundred. So Potential drug targets. Potential therapeutic targets, that's yeah. right. And and to be fair, some of these might show up as potential therapeutic targets that would never be considered if they're in signaling pathways, for example. So so it's up to pharma and certainly people that are are, um, are more versed in clinical trials and, and potential um, you know, pathways for these and implications of side effects to then upscore and downscore these. But the exciting aspect of this is to have a systematic approach by which to do that, to actually make that list of 500 and then upscore some and and start programs. Because we like to say that uh, clinical trials are twice as likely to be successful if you go into that trial with genetic information. That's certainly, you know, been published and, and we like to say that. Um, adding proteomic data, I'd really love to see 
um, what that means for our potential for for improving our ability to be successful in clinical trials. And I think these that's 13, unknown. I guess if you take those 500 targets for potential drug targets divided by 13 different pharma partners, that's like, what, 35 apiece? Yeah, that's right. That's a lot of programs. <laughs> that's a lot of programs. I mean, that's going to be a wealth of data for them. Now I understand why they would invest in such a, a project. Um, when, what is the next step then in the UK Biobank project? And how yeah. do people find out more about it? Good question. Yeah, so the, um, what I fully expect, and I know of at least, um, at least eight abstracts that have been submitted for ASHG this year. Now, ASHG, wow. American Society for Human Genetics, as I mentioned earlier, will be uh, uh, in Los Angeles in October. And so I know uh, that those pharma partners and the researchers within those pharma partners are uh, submitting abstracts to present there. And uh, I'm sure some of them will get oral oral presentations. Many of them will get poster presentations. But I will be keeping a close eye on that, and I will absolutely be there. And I think we should do a podcast episode from there you ASHG. Go. <laughs> we'll have a post ASHG. This is what I got out of it. That no, would be and, great. And uh, maybe drag a few guests on if uh, if we can that'd catch them. Great, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So, and so I, that's what I think is next. I think they're going to be sure. digging into these these um, correlations. Eighty five percent of them novel, so roughly eight thousand novel relationships between genetic regions and protein levels. They're going to be Don't digging you? into which of those are are appear causal within certain diseases. Do you know when they're going to be available, public, uh, public available, the data, and oh, how, how scientists can have access on that? Is it easy process or a difficult process to have access on that? Yeah, so as you, as you probably know, Sarantis, but our, our listeners may not know, the UK Biobank data through a, a data use agreement uh, is is broadly available. So this is one of the, the reasons there's so much use of those data as validation data and, and for discoveries with very clever um, informatic scientists and, and biologists who uh, think of creative ways to use such a, a large data set. The proteomics data, uh, the first set of proteomics data, so the first 1,500 proteins, the subject of the, the June bioarchive paper, those data um, have been stated that they will be publicly available by the end of the year. So I, I expect, you know, by October at ASHG, we'll know better the timing for that. Uh, yeah, those pharma partners, of course, have, have, have had access to those data as they should, which is why they were able to, to publish that, uh, that paper so quickly. Uh, and so the next tranche of data... Uh, for the full 3,000 proteins. And, and can I just say, you know, you see what's possible with 90 proteins in Volker Senadal. Imagine what's possible, you know, with 30,000 proteins, 3,000 proteins and 54,000 individuals. That's a lot of power to detect relationships between proteins and, and many proteins that really just haven't had assays Um for for examining them, so just such a such an opportunity for discovery. We, but we, I fully we touched expect upon, those. Yeah, we touched upon right the enormous investment made to date to collect these five hundred thousand samples. That's right. right to follow up and, all those electronic and get genetics. Yeah, get the whole genome, whole exome data on all these individuals. That's right. And then now overlaying, empowering the genomics with the proteomics. It's as if we're a part of something. That is the next big thing in genetics is proteomics. I think it's you know, and when you think about the um, the central dogma of biology, right? You've got DNA, RNA. We've done a great job of looking at DNA. RNA has been our proxy for real time biology for a long time because it was it was mm -hmm. available to um, to look at uh, with sequencing technologies. In fact, you and I, Dale, I think have talked about how the. RNA seq and the ability to do what we call digital gene expression sold many of those initial instruments uh, that were you know next generation sequencing instruments. But now we have this this ability to measure proteins directly in a in a very scalable way. And I am excited, as you know, about this capability. Uh, but. It's really the researchers and what they can do with it that will tell us uh, the true potential of this.
So. Super. Well, thank you, Cindy, for sharing your thoughts you. on empowering genomics with proteomics. My and we'll pleasure. see you soon. That was great. Thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you for listening to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, brought to you by Olink Proteomics. To contact the hosts or for further information, simply email info at olink.com. 